Well, good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of 2024 of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Apologies have been received from our convener, Claire Baker, who is absent due to other parliamentary business. Uh, my name is Michelle Thompson and as a deputy convener, I'll be convening the meeting in her place. Now, today's first item of business is a declaration of interest by Jamie Halcrow Johnson as a newly reappointed member of the committee. Now, Brian replaces Brian Whittle. But before calling Jamie, I'd like to put on record the committee's thanks to Brian Whittle for his contribution. And I welcome Jamie Halcrow Johnson back and invite him to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Convener. Um, no real reason other than um, I'm a partner in a farming business and the owner of a registered croft. Thank you for, for noting that. Now, moving on, uh, our next item of business is a decision to take item four on our agenda, which is consideration of today's evidence in private, and also to consider an approach paper on the Product Regulation and Metrology Bill, LCM, in private at next week's meeting. Are members content to take these in private? Thank you very much. Now, our next item of business and our main item of business is an evidence session with Registers of Scotland on its activities and performance. Registers of Scotland is a non-ministerial office and part of the Scottish administration directly accountable to the Scottish Parliament. And responsibility for scrutiny falls mainly within the remit of this committee. So good morning and welcome to Jennifer Henderson, Keeper of the Registers of Scotland, and Chris Kerr, the Accountable Officer from Registers of Scotland. Good morning, both. Now, I understand, Ms Henderson, you've got a short opening statement. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on ROS's progress and hello to committee members that we've not met before. Um, I'm joined today by our accountable officer, Chris Kerr. He'll be able to offer insight on ROS's finances, as well as speaking to the detail on areas such as managing casework and delivering the benefits of a completed land register. I'd like to start with a short update on our financial position. We continue to main, maintain a financially self-sustainable position. And the last financial year was the third consecutive year where we achieved a break-even position and we're on track to break even this financial year. ROS remaining cost neutral means the Scottish Government can focus its funding on other areas of public expenditure. Turning next to our open casework, reducing the volume and age of our casework remains our number one priority. Having previously stabilised the volume, Last financial year saw a key milestone towards our aim to eliminate long-standing open casework as our volume of open casework went into decline. Since our last appearance, we have moved, removed over 27,000 cases from our stock of open casework. We continue to set ourselves more ambitious targets around our older casework and are making good progress. Overall volumes continue to reduce. 90% of our registrations are completed within 35 days. And our key performance indicator for clearing older casework is ahead of target. Of course, what matters is how our customers feel about this progress. We continue to achieve a high customer satisfaction score for both legal professionals and citizens. Our autumn survey, very recently received, shows a score of 82.6 out of 100, which is an increase from our spring survey. And that's higher than both UK all sector and public sector averages. We're committed to consistently improving our products and services for customers. Our digital journey has continued at pace, making it easier for customers to submit applications and access the data held in our registers. In parallel, we continue to work towards land register completion. And in the past year, we have made further progress towards delivering the benefits of a completed land register. Our total land mass coverage is now over 95% which is an increase of over 5% since we last met the committee in June 23. Our unlocking SAZINS data is pr proving useful to a variety of customers, and we intend to provide this data in an even more accessible way on our Scotless platform, releasing access for business users in the coming months, and then considering how to make the information accessible to the public. A quick update on our new registers. We've reached the end of the transition period for our newest register, the Register of Persons Holding a Controlled Interest in Land, and we're now preparing to deliver two new registers to support movable transactions legislation. The build of these new registers is progressing as anticipated. 
We couldn't achieve any of this without our people, and we continue to ensure our people, processes, policies and products are fit for the future. We've achieved a 20% increase in productivity in the last financial year, largely driven by our enhanced digital capability, alongside a focus on colleague development and performance management. We've also retained gold status in We Invest in People and gold status in We Invest in Wellbeing. And finally, I'd like to mention public service reform. Ros has been meeting the ambitions of the public service reform agenda for some time, but we have put an even greater focus on this in the light of ongoing challenges facing public finances. We've focused our efforts in the last year on creating greater efficiencies and value for money in areas such as digitisation, procurement, sustainability and workforce planning. And we've also made improvements to our estates. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make an opening statement. And Chris and I look forward to answering your questions today. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to open with a similar area to which uh, you opened, which is in terms of the wider financial climate. And, and uh, you sounded quite optimistic about that. But obviously, the considerable macroeconomic uncertainty, quite uh, tumultuous times we've been going through, must impact your ability to plan your finances and your keep focus on your strategic objectives. Do you consider that you've got sufficient flexibility to manage a variety of incoming risks when you look at the financial climate? Uh, at headline level, yes. I mean, as the committee will be aware, the biggest thing that shapes our income is what's happening in the housing market, and we are well used to managing the, the fluctuation of that. When we prepare our financial plans over a five-year period, we always do a low, medium and high estimate using the Scottish Fiscal Commission's information about what could be happening in the property market. And then we ensure that our planning for the cost and the expenditure of delivering our services we will, will fit within that. And we are well versed in any given financial year if the housing market speeds up or slows down to managing to either pull future planned expenditure forward if we turn out to have more income that we can invest in getting ahead on some of our improvements or if the housing market slows down thinking about what we push into future years but Chris you may wish to come in on a little bit more of the detail on that Yes, no, no, I think that's a very, that's a very full answer. Um, I think we, we model on a kind of fa rolling five-year horizon, um, which allows us to, uh, as Jennifer mentions, uh, allows us to ensure that as long as uh, income is within the upper and lower bounds, uh, which it, it is in the normal run of events, uh, the, the, the last time that it wasn't was uh, in, the, in the pandemic years, which was, that was uh, unanticipated, but broadly within uh, the general economic cycle, uh, we see income coming in within, somewhere within the upper and lower bounds, and then we are able to adjust our expenditure uh, accordingly. On that point, I mean, you, you've articulated very clearly within the normal bounds, but I suppose my question was kind of getting at where it's not normal times, how much specific flexibility you have to do that, because what you're describing to me is exactly what I would expect you to say in terms of these range of parameters. But my question really is about how much flexibility you have should abnormal times occur, which, of course, invariably... They do, because that's the nature of things. Yes. I think we do have a, a reasonable amount of flexibility. Uh, the backstop position, as, uh, as the Keeper said to, to the Parliament and the Scottish Ministers, uh, when the organisation was uh, reclassified a number of years ago, is, is, is the Scottish Consolidated Fund. Uh, although um, I think both Jennifer and I consider part of our job to be not to require a call on that unless we are in truly exceptional circumstances. And moving on from that point, then, in terms of statutory fees, which, uh, for people watching this, they were last updated in 2021, and there isn't an annual inflationary update, uh, uplift, rather. But do you anticipate the need for further statutory fee increases in the near future? Uh, we can see that, that inflation has largely stabilised, but staff inflation has and, and particularly in some of the areas where we might see shortages such as digital. So do you see the need for a further uplift in statutory fees in the near future? Not in the near future. I mean, I think, again, as Chris says, part of our job is to drive efficiency into the business and mean that if we are 
for example, providing pay rises, we're achieving efficiencies to offset the extra cost of that. I think, as Chris also says, I mean, we typically would work on a five-year cycle of planning. So we will, of course, look at whether fees might need to rise in the kind of 25-26 period. I'd also be clear that, obviously, fees are a matter for Scottish ministers. So all we could do is advise that we see a cost profile that might mean we would need to change our fees. <clears throat> But it would be for ministers to decide whether to take that advice. But we have no plans in the near future to do anything with our fees. OK. And, and moving on again around this area in terms of income and expenditure uh, projections, and obviously you regularly update these. And, and your central forecast has previously shown income and costs and not unsurprisingly steadily rising. It now shows that incomes falling back after 2026-27. Can you just give us a bit of a flavour about what's behind these projections? I suspect we already know, but I'd like to put that on the record, if that's OK. Yeah, so um, the way Rolls releases its income is um, when we dispatch cases, we can release the income. So our stock of open casework, which we anticipate clearing in the next three years, by the time of the end of the corporate plan period, provides for some extra income coming in. Thereafter, the forecasting on our income is an assumption that we will just be servicing what the housing market gives us each year, dealing with everything the year it comes in. OK, thank you very much. My, my last question b before I bring it in, in um, Colin is, in terms of Scottish Government support, the Year 3 delivery plan states that your sales require, and I quote, nil resource budget and minimum amounts of capital and ring fence budgets to deliver our strategic objectives. And again, it's following on from my earlier points of income projections at the lower end of the scale, you'll not be able to recover your costs and given that your income projections have already reduced how confident are you be able to cover your your costs in 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 forthcoming years uh, and i suppose i'm trying to probe a bit about that balancing that that kind of cost income ratio and how it affects you uh, yes we are we are confident about, about our ability to do that as the, as the keeper mentioned at the outset we've managed to do that in the last three years we're on track to do that again uh, this year i think it is right to say that at the point where we have cleared uh, the open casework, then there is there is less of a buffer there that we have, although something which is not included in our modelling at the moment is the income that will uh, come from the new registers, so the re registers of movable transactions, which are, are due to commence um, uh, next spring, roughly, uh, subject to uh, ministerial approval. Um, we are also starting to look, as we clear the open casework, we're starting to look at um, other commercial services that the organisation can uh, offer. We already offer some uh, commercial services in competition with the market. Uh, we are looking at doing more of that. Uh, and both those things, in particular the, the movable transactions registers not being as closely related to the housing market uh, as our core registers, we think will give us sufficient flexibility to continue to uh, ensure that we broadly break even year on year. Thank you. And I wanted to bring Bardo Fraser in for a quick supplementary of my questions. Thank you, Bardo. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, to the panel. I should declare my interest. I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland, although not currently practising, and in my uh, previous life spent many, many hours dealing with Registers of Scotland uh, in a very satisfactory manner, I should say. So, uh, no complaints there. Just one question I want to ask as a follow-up to the question about finances, because I can remember back, I think it was just pre-2020, when Registers had built up a very substantial uh, reserve, which if I, if I remember correctly, was in, in the, well into the tens of millions. You you remember the exact figures, and the Scottish government came in and helped themselves to that and took that to just be part of the consolidated accounts to, to spend uh, on on uh, on revenue. Uh, now the registers have moved to a different model. Now you're no longer a trading fund. I, I suppose the question that follows from that was if suddenly we were to get a dramatic slump in the property market, you don't have those reserves to rely upon, does that then mean you would have to go back to Scottish Government to ask for resource to fill up a potential black hole in your trading account? That, that's exactly the position, as Chris articulated earlier. I mean, when, when we were reclassified and could no longer hold a reserve, essentially the risk of a catastrophic shortfall in our ability to fund our service does sit with the Scottish Consolidated Fund and that's where we would go. I think the thing I would just say to, to add to that though is 
that's why we work very hard to do good modelling and it's also why we're working hard to drive in more financial sustainability. Some of the things we're doing to introduce automation, for example, into the way we process casework means that our costs potentially can come down and we're less impacted by the fluctuations in the housing market. But what you say is correct. That would be the position if there was a catastrophic failure, as indeed we saw in the pandemic period where the housing market just ground to a halt for three months and we had very little imp impact income. Okay, and just, just one more question, I can, Convener, just on that point. So, so is, is your general approach simply to balance your account year to year so um, you're not then having to look at adjusting the level of fees to take account of fluctuations in market activity? Oh. Yeah. I mean, we we balance. We look to break even every year, and last year was a good example where the housing market did slow slightly towards the end of the year, and the way we manage our costs, we had some things that we were able to slow down, move the delivery of some things into the future year, but we always maintain a focus on making sure that what we're fundamentally delivering is the frontline service to our customers. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Colin Smith, if you'd like to come in now, thank th th you. Thanks very much, convener, and, and, and good morning. C can I ask a couple of questions um, about your staffing projections? The, the delivery plan sets out the, the, the projected size and composition of the, of the workforce over the, the five-year period, and I see that 2025-26 is set to see um, a shift of staff resources from operational to digital uh, and data. Um, your staff turnover at 6% is quite low. Um, and there's not a lot of detail in the plan of how the shift in staffing um, will be delivered. So are you on track to deliver this change and to do so entirely without compulsory redundancies? And can you say more about how it will be managed and implemented? Um, it, yes. So short answer, yes, we are on track um, to deliver the uh, staffing plan that's in the delivery plan. Um, one of the things the committee will be aware of from previous evidence sessions is we currently rely on a reasonably large number of contingent workers in our digital space and we've put in a lot of effort and I'm, I'm hoping we'll get the opportunity to explore it a little bit more today into how we might convert some of those roles into permanent roles. Um, on the operational headcount, we are retaining the number of people we need to deliver but as we bring in some element of automation to how we do the delivery we will in the future need fewer people to do our operational delivery but we will need more people to service the kind of delivery of the digital systems that underpin the delivery so we've got quite a lot of work going on to do the strategic workforce planning that allows us to know exactly when will people retire? How successful are our recruitment campaigns going to be? What's the attrition rate in different areas of the function? And crunching all of that modelling gives us the confidence we are on track to deliver. And, and to do so without any compulsory redundancy. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Now, you, you, you mentioned, obviously, um, issues around um, agency staff costs, I, I notice, and, um, and, and you, want, you mentioned you want to see a planned reduction in that, but I, I notice, obviously, in 2023, um, the cost of agency and temporary staff was £23.5 million, which is 28% of your total cost. Now, that's up 23% in the previous year. Can you say a bit more about why, at a time you're saying you want to reduce the overall uh, reliance on agency staff, and we've actually seen an increase? Yeah, so, I mean, when we currently rely on... I'm sure Chris will come in and add some detail to this answer, but when we currently rely on agency staff to deliver... They are an effective mechanism for building and delivering our digital systems. And as we've already um, discussed, we cover our costs and our customers want that level of service from us. Um, agency staff do get more expensive. They get pay rises like other, other organisations. Um, and we need to pay the market rate to get the people that we need with those skills. Um, and that's part of the reason why costs have risen for that. We've also had some extra work going on. So Chris mentioned the building of the movable transactions register. They, there are specific temporary people with us doing that build work in the digital space. But once that work's finished and that register's been delivered, those people won't need to be employed by us. Um, so so there's, a, there's a set of reasons why costs have risen. But the real plan is to say 
going forward, there are roles that we would want to employ permanent civil servants to do that digital work. And we've been doing two things. We've been working out something called our employee value proposition, which is why would people want to come and work for us on a permanent basis? In particular, why would someone with digital skills want to come and work for us? And we've been looking at our pay and grading framework for digital staff to make sure that whilst it's not going to be possible to pay what is the market rate for a digital job, we at least want to make sure we're competitive in the public sector. So if someone has digital skills and wants to bring their talent into the public sector, ROS is somewhere they would want to come. And we've had some success actually just in recent months with jobs that we have historically in the digital space never been able to attract permanent talent to want to come and join. We are now successfully getting permanent people so the number of contractors is starting to come down and we hope to see that accelerating. But I think I'd want to be clear with the committee, we will always want some non-permanent staff in our digital um, workforce, partly because digital technology moves on, you want people who can bring the very latest thinking and some of the way to achieve that is to retain some people who you have in on a more temporary basis to bring new skills and expertise, transfer it to the permanent colleagues and then they move on to other work. Of the, the sort of two reasons you give for ranger staff, one of it is um, there's a specific piece of work needing done that you're bringing people in to do and then, and then once that piece of work's done it, it's left but you seem to be suggesting it's because you can't recruit people to do the digital jobs is why you're also relying on agency staff. What, what proportion of your agency staff is people that are doing one-off pieces of work and, and actually covering and, and, and what percentage is actually just covering the fact that you're, you're not employing permanent staff to do a job that's likely to continue in the future? I think, do you want to come in, Chris? I, these costs are quite, I mean, you've got hundred, <coughs> the equivalent of 150 full-time agency contingent staff. I mean, that, 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 that comes to an average of, uh, based on the figure I mentioned earlier, 23.5 million, that comes to an average of 156,400 per agency contingent staff. That's a pretty substantial um, share of your, of your expenditure. Yeah, so I think we, we, we think that around about somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of those posts we think um subject to the work that, that the keeper outlines that we have to do we think can be brought in-house to be you know civil servants um there's two reasons for that so partly it's to do with uh reducing the cost uh, but secondly it's also to do with addressing uh, there is some operational risk from those roles just around how frequently people can move and you'd want to retain more of that in-house so I think I think the reason for being in that position is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the organisation um, had a lot of legacy technology that had to be uh, stabilised and improved, and we did have to invest for a period in specialist resource to doing that, uh, to do that work. Having now done that, we are now I think at a tipping point where we can start to move as the keeper outlines to um, a different mix of of digital workers, which will be some contingent workers for standalone pieces. New registers would be a good example, but the va vast majority of our business as usual digital work being done uh, most likely by by civil servants, by in-house colleagues. So just just to be clear, so what's, what's what's your overall projection for the number of 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 agency contingent staff you're likely to be in place over the next few years? I mean, uh, and, and what is what is what is that likely to be the share of your staffing costs? It's 28 percent at the moment. I mean, what's your projection? For for your overall staffing costs um, being reliant on agency staff? Um, I, I don't have those projections in front of me. I'd be happy to write to the committee with that. It's certainly, we would expect to see it coming down. Um, and we are modelling at the moment how, how likely that is and how much it will come down by, because, as the Keeper mentioned, there are challenges at times with filling those roles, generally, I think, in the marketplace, but in particular for the rates that the, the public sector can, can pay. There are particular challenges there, uh, which is why the Keeper mentions uh, the employee value proposition and other factors that might pull people to the organisation. So we are we're working through the detail of that just now. I think happy to share it with the committee when we have it. I think if I might just add to give you some confidence in our ability to do this. So um, our total digital workforce is about 300 people. So about half of our current digital workforce is contingent workers. So. We have circa 150 people who are employed as permanent civil servants. We retain them well. They enjoy working for us. And in fact, they're going to be our biggest advocates when we go out to the market to try and persuade people that they want to come <coughs> and bring their digital skills to us 
to look at the colleagues we already have and look at how their careers have developed, look at why they work for ROS. So the shift we're looking for is, as, is, as Chris says, to take of that 150 people, about half of them, and get, and get them onto the permanent staff as well. Because, I mean, it, 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 you've, you've got a double challenge because you want to get the temporary staffing numbers down, but you're actually wanting to overall increase your digital um, staffing levels, you know, so um, it does seem it does seem incredibly challenging, but I'll be, it'll be, I'll be keen to see what your projections are for um, the next few years over your numbers. Right to the committee with that, thank you very much. And we don't underestimate the challenge. We know it's difficult, and it, it, it's one of the things, I think, as organisations become more digital, the, w the war for the talent of the people who can deliver that kind of technology is going to become more competitive, and ROS needs to try and make sure that it's on the front foot with having a good proposition about why people would want to come and work for us as opposed to take their talent elsewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll, we'll move on now. Can I bring your, uh, Murdo back in again with your bank of questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Convener. Um, I want to move on and ask some questions about um, your success in dealing with applications and turnaround times. And I was looking at the, uh, the, the data we've been provided about your uh, key performance indicators and how well you're, you're meeting those. I think to, to contextualise this, it might be quite helpful if you just gave us a flavour of how you're dealing with the issue of, of new applications in the context of the backlog that we've heard about. And, and so you know, we've been told you have a case, for example, in the backlog, the oldest case, going back to February 2018. So how do cases end up in that backlog and what you're doing to try and address that, and how does that interrelate to dealing quickly with new applications? I'll kick off, but I'm sure Chris will want to elaborate on some of the detail. Um, so the most important thing we've always said is what we need to do is do what our customers need. So pr predominantly, and you'll be well aware of this, Ms. Fraser, um, predominantly our customers are solicitors who will have a range of cases and applications that they are bringing to us most of their cases, they will come to us, they will get them back within 35 days. We achieve 90% turnaround, 90% um, of cases, start that sentence again, 90% of cases are turned around within 35 days. But we deal with three fundamental types of cases. So if something's already on the land register, it comes in and out as a dealing with whole, they go in and out very quickly. The complexity comes for either a first registration, something that isn't yet on the land register and needs to be brought onto the land register, for those, as you can see in our KPI data, for new cases, we've set ourselves targets to turn around a percentage of those, and we are seeking to increase that target. So even most of our more complex cases that come to us new get in and out within 35 days. The same with the transfer apart, where someone is selling off a piece of their land and creating a new title from that. That does require much more work from Ross colleagues, and it requires much more expert work. So... We've got twin targets at the moment. We've got targets around clearing the cases that have been with us for too long, and we've got targets around making sure we're keeping pace with the new work. The fundamental reason why something might not have got done within that 35-day target initially is a capacity issue. We simply didn't have enough people with the right skills to keep pace with the volume of those cases coming in the door. What we're managing to do now successfully, because it shows up in the numbers, is automate the simple cases, upskill colleagues who've built their experience on simple cases to deal with more complex cases. So we've got a bigger number of staff who can do the complex cases. And those colleagues are essentially dividing their time between working through the older cases and keeping pace with the new cases. And as we bring in more automation, we upskill more colleagues and we get more colleagues. And what we will eventually get to is a position where all the long-standing open case work is gone and it's all the complex stuff. And we have the right capacity to deal with the volume of business that will be coming in the door with new cases at, at the right skill level. So that's sorry. that oh, However I try to explain this, I always make it sound more complicated than it is. But is that is that does that help? <laughs> Yes, it does. But just so I understand this properly, and for people watching, um, is there a reason for the backlog? Are these more complex cases that have kind of been put aside, 
or is this just stuff that's built up historically due to lack of capacity? It, it's, it's primarily stuff that's built up historically because of lack of capacity. I think what we would always be clear is there will be some cases that from the very minute they come in the door, it's going to take us longer than 35 days to deal with. Someone could be working on that flat out for six months. So we want to get to the position where when a case comes in the door and we can see it is in that position, we can have a a conversation straight away with the customer submitting it and say this is a six month turnaround is that okay you know we're putting the people on it but Chris do you want to do you want to add to it in any of this <clears throat> I may just briefly add if that's okay uh, the alternative approach of course would be to work simply from the oldest cases forward the approach that we're taking is to try and uh, deal with the whole of the problem so squeeze down the whole of the problem at the same time there's three reasons that we're doing that fundamentally so the first one is that we judge it's more efficient and effective so i'll give you a short example of that if we have 10 applications that are in the same geographic area but are in uh, different years it's more efficient to deal with those 10 at the same time because there'll be commonality of the underlying mapping, commonality of title conditions probably, and it makes more sense to do those 10 in a run than it does to work purely by year to year in terms of how quickly we can solve the problem. So the first reason's about efficiency and effectiveness. Second reason's about the flexibility that it gives us to deal with expedites. And I think what we've spoken about at the committee before is uh, cases which are maybe not quite expedites, so cases that our customers tell us are particularly important for a given reason, um, but maybe don't quite meet the expedite threshold. That approach gives us the flexibility to deal with those cases. And the third reason is that uh, we think and we judge that it mitigates against the risk of a new backlog growing. So one of the challenges the organisation has had in the past when it's focused purely on the, on the oldest casework is that there will be a, a backlog of new casework will be growing up at the same time. So this approach of, of dealing with the casework in total um, it, it is we're taking for those three reasons rather than, than working from one end to the other um, and as the keeper mentions I think the, the data shows that that is that is working at the moment uh, customer support for that is, is, is strong I would say um, and we have taken the position from I think a, a total a total casework position at one point of 142,000 cases uh, to uh, around about 106, 107,000 uh, as of this week. So uh, we think that we think that is working, but of course we need to continue to be flexible and responsive to what customers tell us. But that's the approach generally. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that, that's very helpful in terms of contextualising it. I've got one or two follow-up questions on specifics. So on the on your KPIs, you you you, you mentioned so your target at March 2024 for first registrations was 80%. Your performance July to September. It's just 66.6. .6. So is there a reason you're quite well off from reaching that target? Um, so so uh, to, I, I may just, if I, if I, if I may just conceptualise the, the, the KPI. So the position that we want to get to, as the Keeper outlined, is a position where uh, somewhere in the region of 80 to 90% of our casework will be done within 35 days. And that aligns to the advance notice period. Uh, and that gives... That would cover the vast majority of residential conveyancing and other things, and it gives those customers absolute certainty that their cases will be done in that period. Then for the, for the very complex cases that can't be done in that period, we want essentially to wrap a dedicated service around them uh, that will stop them perpetuating, but will also mean that we, a part of that will agree essentially a, a timeline for that work with the applicant. So that's where we're trying to get to with the KPIs. Whilst we're doing the balancing, as you mentioned, of the upfront uh, cases and the backlog cases, it's difficult for those KPIs to work perfectly because you're always having to judge, um, you know, uh, in terms of where you're putting your effort against new cases and old cases. So that's the context. Specifically on first registrations, the reasons are twofold. So the first reason is a management choice to focus on more older first registrations than newer ones uh, in order to ensure that we do clear that backlog. Uh, the second reason is that since we set that KPI, we have seen the standards to complex split of our first registrations change. So when we set it, uh, the, 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 the ratio was about 80-20 of standards to complex work. That has now shifted to about 70-30. Uh, and so the complexity of the work that we're seeing through first registrations is increasing. Um, and I think that is probably not a surprise if you think about, you know, 
A lot of the uh, easier to register properties have already come through seasons. We are left with properties that are more difficult. There might be boundary issues. There might be small gaps between properties. Um, so I think we will probably in due course need to remodel and first registration in particular uh, to take account of the changing complexity of the casework there as we get into you know, the, 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 the final the final straight of, uh, of, of completing the register. Okay, so, so, so looking ahead, when do you expect then to get back to meeting your KPI of whatever it is, 80 per cent? So I think I think we do, subject to the judgment that I mentioned around um, uh, around the choice between older and new cases, we do expect to be there or there abouts by the end of the year, by the end of this financial year. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. And then just one more question on the backlog then, because your target, I think, is to clear the backlog by February 27. Are you on track to do that, do you think? Yes. We are. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Jamie, do you want to come in for a little sup on the back of that? I do. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, it was really just on the on on the back of the backlog, as it were. Um, what uh, in uh, what assessment do you do of the economic impact of this on your customers and, I suppose, on the wider wider economy? Do you do you have any economic impact on it? Um, so there's. One of the things that's important to know, and probably this is the thing we should always say up front about um, any cases that haven't been processed, is they're taken onto the application record on the day we receive them. So all the economic activity that could flow from that, somebody remortgaging, somebody choosing to sell it, can still go ahead even while it's waiting registration. It's a different scheme in other jurisdictions. So there's no negative economic impact by virtue of a case taking time to process through the, regist yeah, the registration process because all that stuff can happen and actually it's for that reason that we have also got the expedite process so in the very rare cases where somebody potentially would have a financial detriment as a result of a case not being registered we can accelerate that through and make sure that it doesn't have that effect so at an individual customer level we don't believe there is an economic impact as a result of a case awaiting registration. And therefore, if you roll that up into a kind of macro piece, there isn't an economic impact in terms of lending in Scotland, the housing market in Scotland all still proceeds as normal, um, and this does not have an impact on it. But it is, I think, for other organisations to assess wider economic impact of housing market things and everything else, it's not something we specialise in. And, and so thank you for that, and I think that's, that, that's very clear. You're suggesting that there is an economic impact where there are cases that, that there might be, you prioritise those. Is that the position as well of those organisations are the stakeholders you work with or are there, have they raised any concerns with you? I think our evidence, I mean, we work very closely with the Law Society and um, UK Finance as kind of representative of the lenders and individual lenders and they're very satisfied with the approach we're taking that clearing the open casework and seeing that we'll get to a point where, as Chris describes, it's gone and it stays gone and that we have the expedite process for those cases where there is potentially a problem. They're, they're satisfied that that seems like a sensible approach. Um, and if individual customers, particularly our legal professional customers, get in touch with something... I mean, let me give you an example. So we have a solicitor who was retiring, and he wanted, quite understandably, to make sure that when he retired... He didn't have cases left. That was a good example where we expedited. We just got them done so that he could wind up his business uh, or sell it on or whatever he was doing and that kind of thing. So those really specific examples where someone might have a very individual set of circumstances where it's impacting them, we, we are there to help. OK, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. OK, thank you, Willie. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning. Um, I wonder if I could ask you a few more questions about your digital journey that you're your undertaking and uh, the paper we have tells us that you've been delivering some of the services in relation to discharge of standard securities and so on, which is a great benefit, I think, to the public. So it's to ask you twofold, are you providing more, are you, do you intend to provide more access services like that to digital content that you have in the back office, if you know what I mean? Uh, and do you therefore plan to digitise nearly all of your content that you have? 
So, what's your progress in digitising your services in terms of access, and what's your progress in digitising the content that's behind the scenes? Okay, well, again, we'll probably do a double act on this, <laughs> but um, wh where we are on our digital journey, I always think of it in three parts. There's how do customers submit things to us, and we, as part of what we did during COVID, we brought in a digital submission service. We've now really significantly enhanced that, so the vast majority of cases now come to us digitally. What then matters to customers is, well, how's it processed? So we have always had digital tools. Um, you, well, I say always, not if you go back far enough. Once upon a time, people used paint and ink to do land titles. But for quite a long time, it's our colleagues have worked with digital systems to process the cases. But we've done a lot of work to enhance those systems. So particularly introducing technology that would have sort of present to a colleague what should the title sheet look like and a colleague can just say yes that looks right rather than them having to manually type lots of things in so we're on a journey to get all of that done the bit that bridges that is where might we be able to automate so where can we not have a colleague need to look at a title at all um, we are now automating lots of discharges We've, un out, we've rolled out um, automation of adding on a standard security and later this year we will get to automating of a disposition. Not all dispositions, but a subset of our dealings with holes. So that's, again, part of where the capacity is coming from. And then the final piece of the puzzle is how do we digitise the access to our records. We've had for um, several years now both professional and citizen ability to interrogate the land register, interrogate the crofting register and interrogate some of our other registers digitally, download um, digital titles if they wish. Um, and the, then the other element of that is what about our bulk use customers? So the lending community would like to take all the data around their lending book from us so we've been building application program interfaces to allow our data to directly feed into their data all under suitable licensing conditions so it's a journey we're still on but we kind of feel like we've got all the building blocks in place now and the real thing I think we're quite excited about is how much will kind of automation and that kind of technology really help accelerate in terms of the records that sit behind all of this, we digitised all of our records a while ago. So if you go on to our Scotland system and you want to order up a Sazine record, you can download that digitally and use it. Um, but what we're now starting to do is think about how we kind of one of our colleagues used to describe this as documents to data, downloading a digital document versus downloading digital data, and we're on that journey as well. So we've got lots of plates spinning with all of this, and this is part of our plan over the next few years, which is actually back to why we need the digital staff we're going to need, because there is definitely more to do in getting all of our digital services in, in the best place they can possibly be. But is there anything yeah. I missed there, Chris? No. Well, you, you probably might guess what I'm going to ask next. Um, the more we digitise, the greater the risk. And I don't need to remind you what happened to SIPA and the cyber attack on their records uh, that caused a huge, huge problem and a cost, minimum cost of five million, we think. Uh, have you done a risk assessment on all of this? And without giving any of the details to the committee members, are you engaged in risk assessment of this and proper protection of your data to ensure that you have safe, secure backups of everything that you're digitising? A hundred percent. So, yeah, I, yeah, you will appreciate, won't want to go into lots of detail, but the thing I would reassure the committee on is we have extremely comprehensive risk assessments around our cyber security, our team in the digital space do lots and lots of work to kind of keep pace with the threat. They engage really well through the National, Secu National Cyber Security Centre with understanding what's happening in other organisations and where the threat's coming from. But the other important thing we do is we rehearse and plan the kind of recovery exercises. So our teams do a lot of work about what if something happened, how would we bring systems back up, restore from backups, and also um, practising the kind of management of an incident, who would need to be informed, how would, just by way of example, if something happened, how would this committee get told that we've got a problem and, and what was done? So we are, we have a very, very thorough risk assessment. The other thing I would say is, 
any time we're moving data around digitally, it's subject to a very rigorous kind of information governance risk assessment, making sure that everyone involved knows what needs to happen and it's going to be secure. But I think the thing we'd always say is the threat keeps evolving, so we can't ever let our guard down on this. So that's very reassuring. Um, there's a mention in your uh, uh, business reports about some investment in artificial intelligence issues. It's a small amount of money, Jennifer. It's ten thousand and then forty thousand pounds. I was just curious to understand what's that about? What are you doing by way of investing in AI? Um, so the thing we're experimenting with at the moment with AI is a system called Copilot, which is where it can help suggest. Um, actions that you might want to take and we've um so for our customer service operatives so when someone phones us up and it's a customer saying oh here's my complex case what do i need to do with it we're looking at whether ai can help interrogate all of our very large set of user manuals and help that customer agent more quickly provide a response um, and also for things like governance, how might that help with minuting meetings and things like that as a way of kind of reducing the workload. So I think we'll extend looking at where we want to use AI, but we're dipping our toe in the water at the moment to see the stuff that's out there, how it could help. Recommendations from these systems are, I hope, uh, overseen by human beings to oh, determine whether that course of action oh, should be uh, That's extremely important to <laughs> emphasise that, yeah. yes, that's absolutely the case. It's being used as an assistant to suggest something as a way of doing... I always think with AI, AI is good at some stuff, but for much of it, you do need a human to say, is that the right thing, and am I going to proceed on that basis? I'm glad to hear that. One final question, convener, if, if there's a, a, a time to do it. Um, it's probably, probably more of a legal question, so you may not be able to answer it. If a person uh, passes away who uh, does not have successors to inherit a house, a property or whatever, where does ownership lie if a person is deceased? Do they still remain on the register as the owner, despite the fact that they're deceased? And if there are no known successors, who is responsible for a property in terms of its upkeep and maintenance. Now, you may not be able to answer that, but I'm very The lawyer, that. so I'm looking at Chris. <laughs> so, so ultimately, the property would fall to the Crown, uh, the doctrine of Ultima Series. Um, it is possible that a person might appear on, on, on the register for a while because we wouldn't necessarily know until we're informed uh, and until we're given sufficient evidence that the person uh, has died, but ultimately uh, it would fall to the Crown, and that is administered by the uh, KLTR in Scotland, the Kings and Lords Treasurer's Remembrance. I'm kind of familiar with some of that, but who makes that record on an entry if, if no one takes any action about it? Because I've had several cases with yourselves over recent years about this particular issue. And the register still seems to show a, per a named person who is no longer with us, sadly. Yes, so it will do unless, so, uh, unless someone who knows that that has happened informs us. Uh, so, so technically, that would be an inaccuracy in the register, which is subject to rectification, uh, but the keeper needs evidence in order to do that. So I know that uh, in recent years, um, the, the KLTR are... Um, becoming more interventionist in this space, I would say. They have done a couple of projects recently where they've been uh, you know, trying to identify property more regularly and then bring it back into economic use. So there is work ongoing in that, in that space. It's not directly for the keeper, but in, in the wider public sector. Um, but yes, ultimately, we would need someone to tell us is, is the position problem. There's very rarely someone to tell you, or people like us perhaps, <laughs> that are representing constituent interests. So. But thank you very much for trying to answer that particular question. Thank you, okay. um, Jamie, I don't know if you wanted to come in and supplement any of this. I'll just come in very briefly, if that's all right. Just in terms of the digitalisation, um, how, how do you kind of evaluate things like duplication online? I mean, is that something that you have a kind of ongoing process in terms of the, the, the paperwork, et cetera, the admin, et cetera, you require to avoid or reduce the amount of duplication, perhaps in applications and the like? Um, or is that something you think you've already kind of got on, got on top of? Uh, so I would say, I would say generally we have we have improved the position. There is still uh, still more to do. I think when we were last at, at committee, um, we were talking about our kind of rejection rate being higher than than, than we wanted it to be, and that was to do with uh, information coming into us from applicants not always in, in the right order or in the right format. Uh, that's improved a lot over the last. Uh, 
over the last period. We are still seeing probably our biggest challenge there is uh, superfluous information being submitted to us mm -hmm. um, as part of the application process. So people will submit, you know, digitally, but bundles of, of, of deeds which aren't necessarily relative to the to the title. Uh, but you don't know that until you've made that assessment. Uh, so there is some work that we're, we're doing there. In terms of once once the work is in the organisation, um, uh, we have some quality checks, which are a degree of, um, of, of duplication, I suppose, but positive duplication in the sense that we want to make sure that the information is right. Uh, but generally through our process, uh, it, it is mostly um, mostly single handle and we've eliminated uh, what we would say is uh, non-value add uh, duplication. Okay, have I got time for a very quick? Well, okay, I'm just on the point that Willie Coffey was mentioning, those figures for AI were actually relatively small for, any, for, for any things like that. I mean, do you anticipate, if it all works, that increasing significantly over the next few years? I think potentially, at the risk of speculating, I mean, it, it's the next logical step, having brought automation in, is to understand where can the kind of AI technology support more efficient working, but you know, we recognise it's a it's a new technology. There need to be good safeguards in place. Scotland, I think, is quite forward looking in having an AI register, so that you know all, uh, pe the public know when AI is being used. And we would want to learn lessons from where other countries have introduced AI with you know potentially unintended consequences. I mean, back to Mr. Coffey's question about where does a human need to come into the loop to ultimately make the decision on things and so on. But I think I think. Yes, it's probably the next big technology that's coming that we would be wanting to make sure we are adopting where appropriate. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Just finishing off on that point before I bring Lorna Slater in, what, what is framing your kind of strategic approach to AI and uh, who are you bringing in to help you determine that kind of strategic approach? I mean, it sounds to me at the moment like you're you're trying some things in a fairly small, limited manner, as Willie Coffey pointed out, the spend is relatively low. But how, how are you managing the risk that AI will almost be done to you rather than proactively? Can yeah. you tell me a little more um, about your strategic thinking here? So for exactly that reason, we've established an AI working group within ROS, which reports into our information security group, and they are making sure they're accessing the relevant kind of subject matter experts. They're hearing from other organisations about how they're adopting, and they are developing our AI strategy for us so that we will be clear that how ROS wants and chooses to use AI is, is part of what we're doing strategically but while we're doing that thinking we're also just doing a little bit of experimenting I suppose to understand where things that other organisations are telling us they have used with good effect could support us. Yeah. And have you got a date for that strategy being developed? Um, off the top of my head no but I mean it's part of our overall kind of next phase of digital strategy so perhaps I could revert to you in writing on when we would expect would to have that and Thank we'd you. certainly be happy to share it once it's it would we'd envisage it being a document we would publish once we've created okay. it. Thank you very much. Lorna. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming to see us this morning. I've got some questions around just understanding the work you do uh, a bit more fully. The um, the, one of the newest operational registers, the RCI, is such an important tool uh, as we go forward in terms of increasing biodiversity, getting to net zero, looking out for community interests, management of deer, invasive species, all that good stuff. Um, how complete was that at its launch and what's its kind of sort of functional status in terms of how useful it is for those tools and, and how, how is it progressing to being improved in, in, interesting question, I suppose, about completeness, because it's probably one of those registers where it, it, when, when we set out to launch it, part of the idea was to understand how many pieces of land there were out there that had someone sitting who wasn't the named owner on the register, but sitting behind that land making decisions. Um, so... Our position would be, having gone through the transition phase, so we had two years from the register launching to when it became a criminal offence to not be registered if you needed to be registered. So, And we did a lot of work to working with Scottish Government colleagues to publicise the register, to get out and talk to bowling clubs and organisations who may have been needed to register. And 
so our position would be it's as complete as it can be at the March 24 transition deadline now clearly position for some parts of land changes so the register doesn't stop at that point it will get updates other bits of land will become in scope what we what one of the other indicators about whether anybody thinks there might be things missing from the register is are we getting lots of inquiries with people saying well why is this bit of land not on the register we're not seeing that so we get the odd inquiry and we um when we do we look into it we go back to the registered person or the recorded person and we say is there something missing here but there's not we're not seeing any evidence that lots of people missed registering um in terms of how it's being used um so it's a fully digital register. People who want to interrogate it and get information from it can do that. We do see that happening. So we are assuming that those people are looking up individual bits of land, finding out who it is they would need to contact for a conversation a bit about that land and using the information in the register to do that. But it's the joy of having it as a, a fully digital process that doesn't need a human in Registers of Scotland being part of it, that we're not cited on how those people might be then using the information they gain from the register to go. Does that, does that help? It does. No, that's that's great. Thank you. Uh, again, interested in how things are working. So I'd like to understand a bit more about the process in moving um, a property from the Stacey Register to the Land Register. Just to understand how complicated, what steps it is you need to go through to make that happen. Because I completely understand this, this sort of pragmatic approach about having the functional register. I, I, that makes total sense. But just understanding what the challenges are moving between them. I'll just do a quick bit of context if I can, and then Chris will be much better than me at explaining the details. So um, where we're at at the moment in terms of land on the land register, so f um, the, the fundamental process that brings a piece of land from the Sazine register onto the land register is the first registration process. Chris will explain what needs to happen for that. One of the things we've done is an estimate of how many pieces of land in Scotland are ever really going to transact and our estimate of functional completion and we're in the 80 something percent of saying we think everything that typically transacts is on the rest of 87 percent from memory but I'll, ch I'll check that while Chris is speaking um, so there is a bit to go there is a bit of work to do for things that haven't transacted in a number of years and Chris will explain I think why some things might not have transacted um, but we are getting there with functional completion then there is the wider question of general completion of the land register and how we deal with the pieces of land that almost never transact and they are likely to be subject to the voluntary registration process and I Again, I'll ask Chris if he doesn't mind to just briefly describe the difference between a first registration and a voluntary registration, but I'll hand to you if that's all right, Chris. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll start there. Uh, so the, the main difference between a first registration and a voluntary registration is that voluntary is done by the owner out with any transaction. First registrations are triggered because the property sells or, or, or some other trigger applies. Um, broadly, I would say, in terms of moving land from the Seizings Register to the Land Register, you're doing two things. So the first thing is you're establishing the precise boundaries of the plot of land. Um, and in a modern seasons, relatively modern seasons title, that might be straightforward because the seasons title might already have a plan and that might be relatively simple. At the other end of the spectrum, you might have a, a seasons description that's in writing only. It might be 100 years old. It might say something like 0 0.1 of a point one of a hectare in the parish of X bounded by land owned by Jennifer Henderson and you've got to work out from there where exactly are the current boundaries of that plot of land so boundaries and mapping is the first thing the second thing is trying to establish what are the rights and encumbrances that apply to that plot of land so does it have any servitude rights of access for example over other plots uh, and are there other um, extant encumbrances that affect so burdens conditions that affect that plot of land um, and that again will, will will be more or less complex depending probably on the age of the title or the location of the title so if it's a title that's been established for a long time you might have 100 200 deeds uh, old written deeds on parchment that you have to read through to establish whether there are any conditions in the first place and then you've got to reach a judgment about whether they are still relevant, whether they're, they're still extant, or whether they've been snipped away at by statute over the years, or whether for some other, other reason, uh, you know, negative prescription or something else is applied that means that they're, they're no longer um, effective. Um, and then you take that information and we, we put it onto the register. Um, so that, that's the work that's done. 
Principally, it's done by the applicant, and then we will do a degree of, of, of checking of that and satisfying ourselves that it's accurate, um, and, and then replicating that on the register. So I would say quite a, quite a spectrum of things from cases that will be very easy to do to cases that are really, really quite difficult and time consuming. In terms of uh, in terms of the general registration or the complete re register movement, you're sort of halfway, just over halfway on that. What does that look like in terms of have we done the easy half? Have we done the low hanging fruit? Is it is it the hard stuff that's left? I realize that the stuff that's left is I guess the non functional, less likely to transact, so it's low risk. But in terms of getting that completed, is that something that is isn't terribly urgent, isn't terribly difficult, can just be ticked away at, or is some of that going to be really, really, really difficult? Just understanding what the scale of the challenge is is what I'm after. I think we'll answer that between us. So I suppose one of the things that's useful to know about the land register is, although the Land Registration Act that brought the land register in came in in 1979, the first counties start, and it then counties came onto the land register year by year so 1981 the first counties came on now you could think okay that's more than 40 years so typically in a 40 year period almost all of the residential property in that area is likely to have transferred not all of it because there will be some houses that have had people living in them for more than 40 years but in the fairly near term you could imagine that will finish off and from a residential point of view all the property in that county will be complete the last counties didn't come on to the land register till 2001 so we've got counties where we've only had just over 20 years of transaction and lots of people live in their property for more than 20 years the stuff that's yet to come that's residential in those counties isn't fundamentally difficult it's the stuff that we would expect to be getting in and out within 35 days when it lands with us but it will just take time um, to get that done. I mean, there are other triggers. Remortgaging and things can trigger a first registration, but that's not complex. The stuff that's yet to come that's complex is the stuff that hasn't transacted in hundreds of years. And for whatever reason, it does come through. And then that's where we would be wanting to put that dedicated service around that um, People might bring it forward as a voluntary registration and we would wrap a dedicated service around that. Or if it comes forward because it's transacted, it's going to be at that much more complex end. I mean, just to give you an example, we've got a case in the building at the moment and there are boxes and boxes and boxes of deeds that we are having to go through because it's a big estate. It's not transacted in hundreds of years and we are dealing with the registration of that. So the scale is very, very different um, but yeah, I think we've got a mixture of the difficult stuff left to come, not very much of it, and a, and a fair amount of the stru more straightforward things. Yep. One, just one tiny, tiny last one. Uh, it's just, just out of sort of curiosity, are there certain classifications of property that are more challenging? So large estates, uh, ten tenemented flats, derelict land, are there some that are just sort of typically more challenging as a classification? Chris, do you want to do the complexity split uh, description? <laughs> So, so I would say um, uh, probably uh, th th there is a there is a mix. Large estates tend to be complex properties which don't have physical boundaries, which coincide with a legal boundary. By which I mean, if there's a if there's a fence, or, if there's a fence or a wall on the legal boundary, that's a lot easier than if the if there's no marking on the legal boundary, because then you can have challenges around the tolerance of the ordinance map and things like that. Uh, tenement flats are, are relatively straightforward, I, I would say. So, so it would tend to be um, titles where the Ordnance Survey base map is maybe at a larger scale than we would prefer, which do tend to be titles which are, are, are large land and estates mostly. Uh, you can see complexity in all sorts of other transactions for individual reasons, but that's probably the, the general rule of thumb, I would say. Thank you, thank you. We've got a couple of supplementaries on this. Firstly, Murdo and then Kevin. Thank, thank you, Convener. Just, just one, one follow-up on this issue of land that doesn't transact. Now, some of that, I guess, will be large estates, perhaps held in trust and never transfer. But a lot of that must be in the public sector, is it? Because it will be, be land held by the state, perhaps Forestry Commission. It might be local authority land, health board land. Do we know what percentage of that is public sector? And is the public sector being proactive about moving towards registration? Um, 
I think we'd need to revert on the percentage question, but on the, um, as has the public sector been proactive in getting its land registered? The answer is yes. In fact, Forestry and Land Scotland are done. They have all their land registered. And there was a big push in the five years between 2014, which is when the Land Register 2012 Act came in, and 2019 to really push the public sector to get all their land on. And I think we've written to the committee previously to say, Many of the large public bodies were able to do that, um, but a number of local authorities found that a challenge because it's not a trivial, I mean, it's not about our fees, it's not a trivial cost for yeah, them to sure. do that. But we are still working with a number of local authorities who are gradually putting their land on, I mean, not least because in some cases some of it is potentially attractive for them to sell and it's useful to get it registered before they sell it to potentially do something with it. So, mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you. Kevin. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, I want to tease out a, a little bit more on um, some of those areas where uh, there may be contention, uh, because you've said that 95% of the land mass is covered. You um, stated in an email to the Scottish Parliament Information Centre that the remaining 4.4% is comprised of smaller and older parcels of land which would be extremely time-consuming and costly to complete, hence not representing best value for spend of public funds. But often these parcels of land may well be used as ransom strips, um, if you like, uh, in terms of other dealings. So you say that, um, you know, uh, not representing best value, but they're probably, I would imagine, in some cases, the cases that are taking you a very long time to resolve. I wonder if you could comment on that. So perhaps, perhaps I'll, I'll just set a bit of context if I can, and then and then I think Chris has given me the nod to come in on that. Um, so. When we talk about being at 95% land mass coverage, that, that, that's comprised of three things. It's comprised of things that are on the land register. It's comprised of cases we are working on. We know, we've got them in-house. We're putting them on the land register. And then it's comprised of this work we did called Unlocking Saisines, where it's the land that hasn't transacted in a long time. But what we've done is we've worked with the people who hold the spatial data for that land, and we've matched the spatial data up to our Saisine records so that we now have a map that covers all of that work. The 4.4% that's left is where nobody's come forward and says say they have the spatial data for that. We in the Saisine register can see that there's some someone somewhere owns that bit of land, but actually, can we map it? No, we can't because we haven't got any basis to do it. So what we mean by it would be expensive and time consuming is we have no basis to map that land until someone comes forward with a registration but i don't know chris if you want to sort of before you go on i, I want to give you an example and i'm not going to give you an example from today because that would probably cause a great deal of grief but if i go back to when i was first elected to aberdeen city council some 25 years ago um there was um, a, a small uh, community um, who wanted uh, to see street lighting in a certain path uh, and it was impossible to decide ownership um, and at the time I was very much in favour of the street lighting going in uh, persuaded the council to do so uh, and an old solicitor at Aberdeen City Council said as soon as we do that Whoever owns that land will come forward and suddenly say, you don't have my permission to do so, and I am charging you X amount at the council, X amount of money to do so. And that is exactly what happened. Um, and, you know, there are not dissimilar things which happen in today's day and age. And, of course, um, old solicitor in the day said, these ransom strips um, are everywhere. Uh, and it's been deliberate that these bits of land have been kept. So what I'm trying to get at is how many of those smaller and older parcels of, of land may be used as these kind of ransom strips 
which actually stop folk from doing things in their vicinity, and even the likes of local authorities or other public services doing things in the vicinity um, of those bits and pieces of land. Perhaps I can just um, give you give you how we would respond today if you came to us with the question about who owns this strip of land, because that's an inquiry we would deal with fairly regularly. For something that's in the Sazine Register, we have excellent teams of people who could look at the relevant Sazine titles and come back with you, come back to you with an answer on who owns that piece of land. Now. Mr Coffey's example, potentially that person isn't with us anymore and, and we haven't had the, re the register updated, but we would be able to give you an answer of who is currently registered in the Sazine Register as the legal owner of that piece of land. What we couldn't currently tell you is how far their title might ex extend, because we would search for the specific piece of land you'd asked us about and provide an answer on ownership. Um, and as per Miss Slater's question, if that ownership was something that then there was someone sitting behind making decisions about that would also potentially appear in the register of persons holding a controlled interest in land and might give you a different route to go and ask questions. So we can answer ownership questions even when we haven't got it mapped. But I think Chris may want to come in on the sort of ransom strip question because it's a bit of a broader question, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I would add ter terribly much to that other than, other than the point the keeper, <coughs> the keeper makes that what, what we are trying to judge is the appropriate amount of effort that we should put in and the appropriate amount of public money that we should spend on trying to identify and unlock titles and seasons kind of off our own authority, if you like, rather than because someone asks us. So in the scenario where someone asks us, someone has a, a property inquiry about a piece of land, we will always answer that. Um, but it's about how much effort do we put into trying to uh, identify those small and difficult areas and in a lot of cases, as, as you'll probably have experienced, um, the Sazine Register will be open to different interpretations. So it's not unusual for uh, parties who might appear to be the owner from the Sazine's record to say, no, we don't own that, we haven't possessed it, titles now, with, because very often Sazine's descriptions, I, I gave, you, gave you an example of one earlier, uh, very often they might overlap slightly. That is, that is a a consequence of the history of that of that register and the conveyancing process. Uh, and, and so I'm not convinced there's, there's a huge amount we can do other than to respond when people ask us with the information that we hold. So, final, final point, um, convener, because you say that you'd be able to look at the Sazine register now and get an, an inkling of where ownership lies. What's the difference between being able to do that now and the position quarter of a century ago where that was not the case. So that's well, made it different <clears throat> in terms of your setup. Um, obviously there have been digital changes. What else has taken place in that time? So where you are more confident now than obviously was the case twenty five years ago. Um well I I mean I think it should have been achievable twenty five years ago. I can't speak directly to that. Um I think Probably the process of land registration has helped because in that, if you think of the same area now, there will, I'm sure, not knowing where it is, but just given the general uh, direction of travel, there will be land register titles somewhere in that area, which which helps you to kind of then focus in on where have the Sazine's titles come from and what's the roots of those titles. So I would have, I would have expected, subject to the general... Uh, complexity that sometimes Sazine's deeds are difficult to interpret, sometimes they might overlap, sometimes people might have an interest in, in saying that they don't own a property when potentially they do. Subject to all of those complexities, um, I would have thought that uh, you know an experienced searcher would have been able to do that at that stage, uh, and, and certainly we think we'd be able to do it now within those, within those kind of uh, demarcations. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon. Um, you'll be happy to know that I've only got a few questions um, needing answered that uh, clarify some of the points because most of my questions have been covered. So, um, first thing I was wanting to ask was in relation to your opening statement when you were talking about the landmass you'd achieved just over 95 per cent. And last year when you were in front of the committee, it was just over 90 per cent. So, given the difficulties you've expressed, how have you? 
gathered another 5% of that. Is it from the backlog? Is it from the register of safe scenes transfers? I mean, how have you closed that 5%? Mo it's a bit of both. So I'm just looking at all the exact figures. So every year we're adding between one or two percent land mass to the land register so mm. some of it is land register obviously we then get more work in progress in so someone sells off a field and we go and they build a set of houses on it and we register all of them and um so it's predominantly that we're getting more genuine land registered titles a little bit of it will be some additional unlocking saving data has come into us we had a very good re relationship with the rural payments folks in scottish government who were able to share some of their data with us but looking at our figures here most of it has come from increasing actual land registered land mass Remaining 4.4% that you were speaking to Kevin about earlier on, um, do you see that gradually being nibbled away or are you basically at a point where it's not worth trying to investigate because of the costs involved? A little bit of it may get nibbled away in the sense that if something that, you know, has never transacted, nobody's come forward with the mapping data that we can use for unlocking savings. If it suddenly gets sold and we get asked to register it, well, it'll come on. But for the most part, it won't, we think. And it'll be something we'll need to think about in the future. What do we want to do? I mean, I, one of the things I often say is no jurisdiction in the world, with a, probably a couple of exceptions, has ever achieved a complete landmass coverage. There will always be little bits of land that sit between strips of land, and it, the question is what happens to them. So, g given that I don't have a legal background, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for a bit of clarification. In your Category 2 Unlocking Sassines, you have stated there's no state guarantee of title. What does that mean? Uh, I'll let Chris explain. <laughs> uh, so, so the land register, the statutory scheme in the land register has a, a state guarantee, a warranty to applicants. So essentially, if you are registered as the owner of a title in the land register and it turns out for one reason or another that you are not the owner, uh, you will be compensated for that um, subject to the statutory scheme. Um, the, principal reason for, for having that is that it, uh, it facilitates transactions. So somebody purchasing from you doesn't need to look behind your title because they can purchase from you, securing the knowledge that even if there's a problem, a latent problem with that title, the statutory scheme covers it. That applies in the land register only, uh, not, in, not in the savings register. Because there's no proof of ownership? Um, so, I mean, so partly, but I mean, I mean, it's to, it's to do with the, the history of the legislation. So, land registration was introduced uh, to deal with, I think, I think two principal weaknesses of the saving system. Uh, the first was uh, the lack of a map, mm. uh, and the second was the lack of a state guarantee. Mm. Uh, most jurisdictions, as the keeper mentions, have some form um, of, of state guarantee. They work slightly differently in different jurisdictions, but most jurisdictions uh, have one. My last point is in relation to the registers of people holding um, controlled interest in the land. Um, you've highlighted that people will be able to identify online who owns individual pieces of land, but are you going to be producing any summary information about the pattern of land ownership uh, and who actually owns land from local authorities to foreign-owned companies, etc.? So we currently, I mean, we re Registers of Scotland produces some stat some reporting around land ownership. We produce an overseas ownership report and things like that on a semi regular basis. Um, and we're always looking at what would be useful for the people who use our data. So just to give you an example, recently there was some um, interest in understanding about patterns of transfer on islands. So we produced a separate report that looked at how the islands housing market compares to the wider country. Um, so I think it's really, if there are things people want to know, we're in a position now to produce reporting on that. So beyond request it's not something only produced on an annualized basis it, it, I, what i mean once with the thing with any of our reporting is it takes a little bit of time to set up the reporting mm. and we 
pride ourselves in making sure it's all been validated and statistically. So we tend to wait for someone to suggest it would be a helpful report to have. Once we've set something up, it becomes easy to run it on a semi-regular basis. And if we see there's an interest in a report, so yeah, if members of the committee have things they'd like reported on, we'd be very happy to pull that data. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's just a couple of wee points I wanted to pick up, uh, just some rapid fire questions. Uh, rejection of applications. Uh, which your latest data shows it dropped down to 6.9% from 7.9% between the years 2022 20, and 23 and 23 to 24. Uh, what's your, your insight into the reduction uh, this year and what are your plans to get it back down to the sort of 5 or 6% which it was in previous years? So we think there are two things that have driven the reduction. Um, the systems that people submit data through, we make it ever more difficult for them to make a mistake. So it, that, that flushes out some of the things that people um, typically might get wrong. And we continue to work very closely with solicitors about the 10 most common mistakes we see and how, how to, to get rid of them. So, and I think as we bring... Every time we see mistakes, we think, could we build something into the system that stops people doing this? The thing that will happen next, which I hope we can do, is solicitors fill in an application form as they send us a deed. Sometimes the information on those two things doesn't match, but we think we ought to be able to push upstream that checking so that actually solicitors can't press send if there are mismatches, because what happens at the moment is we spot there's a mismatch and we reject it. So it's things like that, that as we introduce uh, automation, and it may indeed be another good use of where AI could help exactly. us, that kind of checking. OK, and I think Kevin's got a quick point before I do my last speech. I, I do, and it comes back to Gordon's point and the answer you gave around about compensation. What about in cases of fraudulent disposition, I think, is the, um, the term uh, of which there have been cases in recent times in the northeast of Scotland and in um, West Lothian, if I remember rightly. How do you deal with those? Um, so they, they would be subject to the, the statutory scheme on the assumption that the, the grantee, i.e. the person purchasing, um, is, is innocent and not involved in the fraud. They, they, so... There are, there, are, there are different scenarios. Impersonation frauds are, are one which we have seen. They are thankfully rare, but they have happened on occasion. Uh, generally, the way in which that will work under the current uh, scheme is that the, the true owner, the person who has been defrauded, uh, will get the property back in most cases, uh, and, and the, the, the defrauded purchaser will get financial compensation. Uh, most schemes in the world, you need to draw a line between uh, what they sometimes call the mud and the money. So who gets the property and who gets the financial compensation? Uh, and that's the way this, the scheme in Scotland is, is currently balanced. In terms of your reaction to any allegations of fraudulent dis disposition, how much of a priority is that for you folks in terms of trying to find the true answer um, for people who are obviously in very difficult positions? Uh, so it's a... It's a, it's a Top priority, I would say. Um, generally, in these cases, by the time uh, the registrar or the keeper becomes involved, uh, usually the police would be involved first, usually the courts would be involved. Um, and, and so generally, uh, our role then would be to provide evidence for any, any court case that was pending and then to respond on the back of that. So quite often what you'll, hap you'll see happening is the, is the courts uh, declaring the deeds to be fraudulent. Um, that happens in most of these cases, and then the keeper can uh, respond on the back of that in terms of uh, updating the register, compensating the, the relevant parties. And then the keeper does have powers to pursue the fraudster uh, for compensation for the money that she's paid out. Uh, and we, we do do that on occasion where it's open to us to do. Um, but, but, you know, those individuals may or may not have assets that make that worthwhile, but it is something that we do look at on a case-by-case -case basis. And that would be a priority, because that was the question for you. Yes. Obviously, everybody asks us to go through the process, but that would be a priority for you, yes. would it? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Last couple of questions. I wanted to uh, just pick up on a uh, citizen score. Uh, and I know you've done a lot of work on this and you've had different sample sizes, which we, we understand. Uh, but I wanted to understand when you plan to put in place a KPI for citizen uh, score. And I'm thinking about how that will appear to members of the public so that they also can track that improvement. 
something I'm planning to do for our next financial year's plan. So when we roll out our year four delivery plan, I will be setting a target for a citizen score because um, I think we're now in a position, having run the citizen survey several times, we a know we're getting a statistically significant sample, but also critically, we know what is causing dissatisfaction amongst citizen customers and therefore what we would need to do to improve the score, because I will be keen to set a score, which is to try and improve from a baseline. And in order to do that, we need to know. And I think we are now at that position with our most recent um, citizen score. We got some really valuable insight about for citizens in a particular age demographic the user friendliness of our website which we're now seeking to improve and then we would hope that we therefore see a further improvement in the citizen score next time and therefore we're like right we know now what we need to do in order to drive an improvement so next next financial year very much. Uh, and my last question it concerns unlocking savings. Uh, obviously, it's a it's a key part of your statement that 95.6% of land mass coverage has, has been reached. However, we can only access the data if you spe we specifically contact you to request it. What's your plans for making sure it appears on, on mainstream platforms like Scotlist and so on? Yeah, so in the next few months, we plan to get it up on Scotless, um, and thereafter, your committee will be aware there's sort of there's two versions of Scotless. They draw from the same data source. There's a citizen version and a and a professional version. So we'll get it up for professionals first because it's professionals who are the people who have been using it up until now, and then we will look at how we make it available to citizens. Yeah. And in terms of the differential timings between your kind of business customers and your citizen customers, what, what are you able to give us a little more flavour of what that might be? I would anticipate once we've done the work to add it on to Scotless Professional, it's the same technical work that would happen for the citizen side. I think the thing we will want to be careful of on the citizen side is real clarity for citizens about what that data is telling them, what they can do with it and so on. So we will just want to make sure that we've, we've done some work with our we have very good people who do sort of user experience testing to understand how might citizens use that data, how might they tie it up with um, RCI data and things like that. So I would say months, not ages afterwards, but we could revert in writing if that would be helpful with a specific time frame. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'd like to, uh, that brings us to the end of today's evidence session, and I'd like to thank you both very much, Jennifer Henderson and Chris Kerr, for joining us uh, today and giving all your information. And I suspend the meeting and now move to private session. Thank you. Thank you very much for